Hi, I'm Len Testa, host of the Disney Dish Podcast with Jim Hill. This is the first of our two December shows. If you need a break from this month's holiday preparations, you know, all the chipmunk roasting and Jack Daniels nipping at your nose, check out our 1964 World's Fair audio recordings at disneydish.bandcamp.com. We've got three episodes available, more than two and a half hours long, from our sold-out show this fall in Flushing Meadows, New York. Jim and I talk about Walt Disney's participation in the fair, how he personally designed many of this show and ride elements, and how those things that Walt touched can still be seen in the Disney parks, especially Epcot. Tickets to this live show are $80 each, and all of the audio is available for pay what you want at disneydish.bandcamp.com. So if you like what we're doing here, and, uh, and you don't want Jim to live on only reindeer meat again this winter, check out those shows, disneydish.bandcamp.com. And hey, thanks. Welcome back to another edition of the Unofficial Guide Disney Dish Podcast with Jim Hill. It is early December, and of course the first thing that you think about in early December is golf. At least I do, because uh, just opening up last month in Walt Disney World was the new Four Seasons Tranquilo Golf Club, which is supposed to be super, super fabulous. So Jim and I were talking about this, and we thought it would be fun to do a show on the history of golf. In Walt Disney World, and in order to give us that history, is the man himself, the sixth Spice Girl, Mr. Jim Hill. How's it going, Jim? Wow, that would be chunky spice, wouldn't it? <laughs> that is, isn't that a piece picante? Isn't that a <laughs> Ooh, we're, <laughs> we're just going to step over that. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought, uh, you know, it, it, particularly given uh, 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 Tranquilo, uh, it used to be Osprey Ridge. Right. Uh, that this might be an interesting time to sort of look back on the whole history of golf at Walt Disney World because, um, I mean, as far back as uh, February 2nd, 1967, when, uh, you know, the folks at, uh, you know, I mean, Walt had just passed away some, you know, six weeks earlier. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so here they are. They're sitting down with the Florida legislature. Everybody's crowding into the Parkies Theater to see the presentation of what, you know, what is the Disney company going to build here? And they had already bought all the land, right? The they had already bought all the land and Walt had, had, in fact, what's kind of interesting is that, uh, Walt makes the movie for, uh, you know, the Epcot movie on October 28th, 66. He dies December 15th. All right. So there's, wow, so there's like six, seven weeks later. Right. And so and then just six or seven weeks late after that, here he is. You know, this is the first time the film's going to be shown in public and everyone's going to see what the plan is. And up until this point, nobody quite knew what it was. But here's Disney, you know, straightforwardly talking about how, you know, yeah, there's going to be a theme park similar to Disneyland, but five times as large as the one in Anaheim. And adjoining the theme park will be championship golf courses, tennis course, uh, courts, water sports, and a series of hotels and motels for the family vacationer. So, so why why golf? I mean, was Walt a golfer, or was it this something where he thought, well, it's Florida, we have to have golf? Well, it was more about the fact that they were trying to convince people that. Disney World was not going to be Disneyland. This was not going to be a theme park, a parking lot. Because, again, face it, you had to convince people to fly all the way down to Florida or drive down to central Florida, you know, to, to, you know, to go to this place yeah. and to just have a park wasn't enough. So and, and it had to be a destination. It had to be a destination. And, you know, and getting that extra day in, uh, you know, just meant that there had to be other things to do. I mean, just cloning Small World or Haunted Mansion was going to close the deal. I mean, you know, yeah, there were there were new, you know, rides and shows, you know, Country Bear, Hall of Presidents, but I, that wasn't going to make Dad stay an extra day. So, right, uh, the and, golf might. And the other thing to remember is that on you know the guy who actually helped pick up the reins after Walt passed Card Walker was this huge golf fan. In fact, if, really? if you, yeah, if you, in fact, if you go down Main Street USA and look up at Card's window, it actually reads Dr. Card Walker, licensed practitioner of psychiatry and justice of the peace. We never close except for golf. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Card right from the get go was, was, you know, just believed hugely strongly that, um, you know, it, that, that, 
this place needed golf. More to the point, you know, Card so strongly, you know, just was such an enthusiast and played golf all the time and, you know, you know, thought of himself as, you know, sort of an amateur pro that he dressed the part. In fact, if you ever went to a Disney function and you had to find Card Walker, you were invariably told, look for the guy who's dressed like a golf pro. He's <laughs> got the plaid pants. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Really? That was his uniform. That's that's That incredible. was his uniform. So so anyway, so now it's time to figure out where the Disney golf courses are going to go and what they're going to look like. Now, to be honest, if you look at the photos of Walt standing in front of the uh, the sort of the the working field plan for uh, Walt Disney World, you can actually see golf courses kind of roughed in next to where the sort of the motels that were all sea themed, uh, the Cape Cod and uh, the Fiji Islands and that sort of thing were supposed to go. Um, but they hadn't really locked in their place yet. More to the point, they hadn't really locked in their design. And as soon as the world found out that Disney was going to make, you know, include golf courses as part of, uh, you know, a, a, this resort, mm -hmm. you know, all these people sort of rushed at the company and volunteered for the job. And th the interesting thing is Walker actually sort of stepped around all these guys and reached out to an architect called Joe Lee, uh, who was – very highly regarded for some of the golf courses he designed in the United States, South America. Oh yeah, but, I see the uh, I see the golf courses. Yeah, I'm looking at the thing. Yeah, you're right. They're sort of yeah, they're sort of tangential to the uh, to the other stuff. Okay, there you go. Um, but Car Lee had come to Card's attention because he had designed the site of the 1968 PGA National Championship. Okay. So it's like, okay, I want to meet the guy who did this. So. Uh, Walker reaches out to Lee and says, Joe, we've had people from all over the country come in uh, who called us for this, this golf course design job. We haven't heard anything from you. And, and Joe, you know, <laughs> actually played it pretty cool. He said, look, I always think it's the client's responsibility to go look at the golf courses. Uh, if they see something like contact the owner and then find out what they think they thought of the architect. I uh, said, I've never contacted anybody for a job. And, in, in Walker's eye, that was like, okay, interesting response. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you come down here and come walk the property with us? So this is April of 69, and they, they are just literally starting construction of the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> you know, which is going to open in October of, of 71. There you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and go. <laughs> okay. And so, you know, they're, what they're doing is that they bring Joe over to where they're going to build the poly. Because, in fact, if you look at, uh, you know, for example, uh, a lot of the early models, in fact, they, the model that's used for uh, that 1970 preview booklet, you can actually see the golf courses, the golf holes seem to be really, really close to the Polynesian. Mm -hmm. And that was deliberate. In fact, they, they were kind of thinking about that would be another perk of staying at the Poly, that, you know, the golf course was literally right outside your door. And, you know, so Joe goes down and is walking the area and it's just and he looks across the way and here are like 35 acres of ground that's much higher, that's surrounded by swamp, which could immediately be turned into water hazards. And he's he goes, look, that's where the clubhouse should go. Wow. And, you know, it said, look, there just wasn't enough room around the Polynesian to get all the holes in and and put in the big driving ranges and all the parking. Everything would have been too jammed up. Yeah. I mean, a golf course is big, right? Let's face it. That's it. Exactly. Um, but, but at the same time, I mean, the Imagineers uh, were kind of married to this idea. I mean, they were really hesitant because that they they had always thought, well, this has got to be a perk of staying at the Poly. And, you know, so it's like, look. You know, Joe's like, look, you got to spread this out. This is golf. More to the point, do you really want golf balls raining down on your customers? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but this is where it gets interesting. Um, what they he did as a sop to try to win them over to the idea is, it's like, well, all right, let's create some connective tissue. So the initial structure that was built there, the two-story tall clubhouse for the the Disney, uh, what would eventually be known as the Magnolia and the Palm. Mm -hmm. Um, was designed to have a South Seas feel. Um, it, it, in fact, it featured virtually the same architecture and landscaping style of the Poly. Really? Yeah. And, and so it was one of these things where it's like that was enough to get 
the Imagineers to sort of sign off on it. Uh, and But again, he insisted that there had to be some distance. So basically the clubhouse wound up being two, what is it, uh, a quarter of a mile away from the closest monorail stop which turns out eventually to really bite them in the ass, but but we'll get to that. Really? Uh, okay. Anyway, so the original plan was that, that Jolie was going to design three 18-hole golf courses, wow. uh, uh, going to be par 72s, mm-hmm. uh, but at, these were all going to be – the language they used, they were designed to challenge vacationing golfers. Uh, but at the same time, demonstrate the way that man and nature could work in harmony through proper planning and use of a natural setting. Okay. So, so we're kind of drifting back to the whole Disney uh, wilderness preserve thing. You know, even the golf course was going to be one with nature. Um, but huh. you know, so, so you had the palm and the magnolia, mm-hmm. uh, and then you were going to have down toward uh, Black Lake, but what eventually became renamed Lake Buena Vista. Uh, was going to be the Lake Buena Vista golf course, okay. uh, which would open in 72. Uh, so anyway, I mean, here's a guy who's getting to design, uh, you know, 54, you know, holes at a, at a golf course, uh, three golf courses all at the same time. Yeah, which, and, is, which is practically unheard of, right? I mean, you make it yep. a commission for one, yep. you know, but, to, but to do three, right? And at the same time, 36 of these holes have to be ready for vacationers for the first year. And that's, that's tough, right? Because you got to, you have to grow the grass. And it's, we're not just talking about, you know, throwing some seed down from Home Depot. Right? Well, it, and that, that's it exactly. You know, just in fact, you know, that's been kind of one of the running themes of the Disney golf courses about how they plant and go, oof, not that stuff. And, you know, five years later, rip everything out and oof, not that stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's been kind of tough for them, but. Uh, the interesting thing, Joe got in there early enough and had – got to understand that there were 9,000 guys on site constructing the hotels and the the monorail and the Magic Kingdom and the roads. And, you know, Joe was able to grab bodies here and there and actually got the golf courses in and ready to go ba- basically ahead of the parks and the hotels. Wow. You know, um, and, you know – it's what's kind of funny. It's the late summer of 71. Um, and it looks like everything else is not going to make it. You know, the, you know, it's doubtful that the, the magic Kingdom's going to be ready for October 1st. Likewise, the contemporary and the poly. Um, but you know, here comes card Walker doing a walkthrough and he just, he loves how the courses look. And so he flies back to Burbank and he announces as he comes to the door, all right, you know what we're going to do? We're going to hold a PGA tournament in December. <laughs> sure. And everyone's like it's December of of seventy one. Wow. All right? You know, so you know, he turns to um a, a, a gentleman's name is Sandy Quinn. Okay, he was the first head of marketing for Walt Disney World, and who knows nothing about golf, right. but you know, he does know that you know that that. Card has said, look, I want big names there. I want Arnold Palmer. I want Lee Trevino. I want Jack Nicholas. And, and, and Quinn's now, wait a minute. Okay. Now I know Arnold Palmer is associated with Bay Hill, which is in Orlando. You know, let me go talk to him. So, you know, dr- literally drives over to Bay Hill and <laughs> knocks at the door, Mr. Palmer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's it exactly. And, and, <laughs> But but at the same time, you got to remember that everyone who lives in Orlando is fascinated by Walt Disney World. They haven't been able to get in yet. Oh right, it's it's a curiosity. Yeah yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's like, well, would you like to come over and take a look at the sites and maybe take a look at the courses and and to be honest, you know, so he brings them over and Arnold's really not all that interested in the courses, but he keeps looking off in the distance, and it's like, well, you know, what is he looking at? It's like they're loading the monorails onto the beam. Oh. And yeah, Arnold Palmer's never seen that before, right? He's All right, golf courses. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, what's that? And so, well, uh, let's that, take a look. It's our monorail. <laughs> yeah. And so Sandy runs Arnold over to the the monorail, and of course, you know that the, all the guys who were working on the monorail say, "Wow, it's Arnold Palmer." It's like, do you want to go for a ride? And so, for the next five hours, <laughs> he takes take Arnold Palmer for the monorail on the monorail, and he's just running around the empty track, and he's having a ball. And they let him, 
you know, he's, he's just like a kid. And so, um, and, and it, it, Sandy, it's some wonderful quotes from the, the piece that he did to the Sentinel about this. It's like, we said a little prayer, hoping the damn thing wouldn't fall off or something while he was <laughs> on it. Gulford dies in monorail. Mon- but, you know, so he, he gets off the monorail and it's, so we start talking a little bit about the, the golf tournament. He says, not a problem. Sign me up. I'll call a few friends. And <laughs> it's like, it's like, yeah, you don't want to get Frank Sinatra in. Ah, you know, Frank. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and sure enough, I mean, he, he for the first tournament, he lines up uh, Jack Nicholas, uh, Lee Trevino, and all of these big names. And meanwhile, of course, Disney, because, you know, they're just trying to get it done. You know, uh, Larry Campus, who was in charge of the tournament, it describes how that very first year they were spending 12 to 18 hours a day just getting everything ready on the golf course. And he remembers building the bleachers under floodlights the night before. <laughs> Uh, the yeah, they, he's over there, like you know, fastening in the uh, the seat. Wow! But all, all the grass, all the bunkers, all, all the water hazards, everything was ready to go. Everything was ready to go, and Just the other infrastructure, like you don't think about lighting and bleachers and you know walking paths, probably and stuff like that for you know thousands of people. Yeah, I mean, well, uh, we'll get to that in just a sec, but but need to back up a little bit here because um. It's kind of an important moment happened uh, in in Disney history uh, on on October first. Um, you know, Card Walker and oh, seventy one. Yeah, seventy one. Okay, so you you've got you know Card Walker and Don Tatum, who's basically the VP of Disney at that point, are on site. And as soon as the park opens, you know, and as soon as they see that. You know, they're not quite getting the attendance they they were hoping for. I mean, remember, it had been projected that maybe 200,000 people would try to cram in on opening day, and they only got 10,000. Um, that, you know, that, that's off by a little bit, yeah. Uh, off a little bit. You know, that, so Don and Sid Card to, you know, to, to you know, sort of, you know, they golf away their woes. They go over to the golf course, and, you know, their, their prior immediate priorities, let's go play a round of golf. All right, let's let's just put this behind us. Um, now jump ahead three weeks. It's the official opening of the park and, you know, they're now staying, uh, Card Walker, Don Tatum and Royo Disney are staying in a condo that's being built down on site for the third golf course for the Lake Buena Vista golf course. Okay. And it's at this point that, um, Roy has finally been filled in on about how much Walt Disney World actually costs to build, which isn't the three hundred million that that Card had been telling him about. It was the you know uh, it was closer to four. Wow! And, and, and Roy, this, this is this is when four hundred million dollars is a lot of money. Yeah, and Roy's furious. I mean, absolutely furious. But but Card is the interesting thing. Card was one of Walt's real. You know, he was good. at the Walt Disney Company. You either one of Walt's guys or one of Roy's boys. You were either a financial guy or you were creative. And Card, uh, who started in the mailroom in, in 38, you know, in, in you know, 30 years later, is a VP of the company, um, actually comes at Roy pretty hard to the effect of, look, I told you about this. You know, I, I, you know, and you don't want me to go to the board of directors and tell them about how Walt's brother is going senile, do you? <laughs> God forbid anything should happen. <laughs> yeah. And so Roy actually goes back to Burbank and consults with the company's lawyers about is, you know, how would he go about? And this is actually in Bob Thomas's building a company. The, you know, the phrase that he uses, how do I go about clipping card walkers wings? You know, because this guy at this point had gone from being, he was the head of marketing in 65. Mm-hmm. When Walt passed, he became uh, head of operations. And by the time, you know, it, it's 68, 69 rolls around, this guy is now, you know, basically running the show. I mean, you know, yes, uh, you know, that, that Roy is president of the Walt Disney Company. But, you know, Card CEO and and more to the point, he, because he's been on the board since 1960s, 60, he's got a lot of guys in his pocket. Right. So it, it's kind of a weird situation. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, before Roy can really do anything, we could, he keep, you know, he has a cerebral hemorrhage on December 20th, 1971 and dies. And so. 
Card really kind of gets off the hook. Um, <sighs> you know, but it, wow. again, uh, to me, it would always would have been interesting whether Card would have wound up golfing somewhere else in 72 if, if you know, if Roy had lived even just a few more months and had managed to get him out of the company. Wow. So anyway, so we have our first, um, you know, going back to the tournament now. Mm -hmm. uh, tournament, and, and, and again, you got to understand, there's kind of method to Card's madness because as a former marketing guy, he knew that, you know, basically the golf courses were going to get overshadowed by the theme parks and the hotels. But if they had a PGA uh, tournament, and, you know, that, that, that would help raise their profile. Oh, yeah, you get, uh, so it's probably televised. Mm -hmm. You know, you probably get, uh, you know, so typically that's what, two or a couple of days of coverage? Well, actually, it, it started November 29th, uh, and ran through December 5th, 1971. Oh, wow. Uh, there was 150, it was called the Walt Disney World Open $150,000 Golf Championship. And, um, uh, and again, Nicholas took it the first year and actually won it the next two years. Uh, and it was, you know, the weird thing of it was it was a, it, if you were a fan of celebrities or golf, you know, pros of the year, it was a great event to go to because, you know, everyone's there. Everyone's there. I mean, you, you got to see Joe DiMaggio, Johnny Bench, Jackie Robinson, and entertainers like Fred McMurray, Robert Stack, Charlie Pro, and Lawrence Welk. Lawrence Welk. Um, why, why not? Yeah. So anyway, uh, jump ahead to 73. And again, because Card wants, seriously wants, you know, the golf to really take off at Disney. He decides that having a golf club isn't enough. So they build a golf resort. And a uh, golf resort opens in 73, uh, only has 151 rooms. Where, where, uh, where was this? This was actually, uh, <laughs> you know, they just sort of took the clubhouse and just built out the right <laughs> behind just, it. They just kept going. <laughs> yeah. Now, the downside of they throw this thing open in 73, but, of course, October of 73, the oil embargo. Oil embargo, yeah. So, so yeah. This, is, this is across from where the Polynesian was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, in fact, I mean, it, anytime you've driven by the Poly – and headed toward the Grand Flow, you've seen the driveway to the left. You yes, just, yes, yes. Yeah. You just go up that driveway, and there they are. Um, really? Yep. Yeah. And now, where this this gets interesting again? Seventy three, we have the the oil embargo, and Disney actually stops everything in its tracks at that point because attendance tanks for about six months, and they get really scared. So, for example. Uh, the Asian hotel or, or the Thai, depending on, you know, the year, the, the name of this thing, that 500 room project gets shut down. Uh, it's left empty for another 15 years before finally becoming the site of the Grand Floridian. Uh, I've actually heard from a couple of folks that, um, Space Mountain would have probably never have been built if they hadn't before this project or the, the, this property wide stop construction order came down they had just poured the foundation two weeks earlier oh wow so so within two if it was two weeks later some other glitch it never would have got done yeah and you know that, <laughs> wow. and mind you there was a contract with rca but that you know that would have they easily gotten around that but anyway um wow. where this this gets kind of interesting though is as early as 1975 uh the pros who took part in the disney uh, golf, uh, the, the PGA show down there, uh, the, the championship began to complain that, that they weren't drawing big enough crowds that, you know, they, they'd be, they were playing to basically empty bleachers. And, um, and so you had, and, and that was a problem for them. They, uh, you know, I mean, these are guys who were used to playing to these huge galleries of hundreds, if not thousands of people. And, right. and a couple of, just a couple of dozen would show up and it was like, well, what's the problem? And, you know, let's be honest. The problem is that across the way is the world's greatest theme park. And and more to the point, people, you know, in spite of all the money that Disney's paid to build, you know, this clubhouse and now this uh, you know, 125 room, you know, golf resort, which, by the way, had the biggest rooms on property that they were two or they were 450 square feet. Wow. You know, uh, but you know, the argument was, well, you're bringing golf bags in. You got to have some place to put them. Okay, fair enough. 
Um, but, but nobody was coming to watch the pros play golf. And to be honest, the golf resort just wasn't doing the business. It's not what people think of when people think of Walt Disney World, right? It's more of a, it's more of a side thing, right? And, and, and then more to the point, I mean, this is where it gets strange that the, the golf resort, which is only, again, it's a quarter of a mile away from the, um, you know, from the monorail station at the Polynesian. 1,300 feet. So not, I mean, yeah, it's spitting distance, right? Okay. Polynesian and the Contemporary at this time are basically completely booked, you know, 365 days a year. Sure. Uh, the best, the best the golf resort did at, at its height of popularity, it was 60 to 70%. Wow. And that's only yeah. 150 rooms. Yeah. And, so 100 and they, rooms are basically occupied at any given time. They couldn't get people in there. And it wow. was like... And I remember talking with Larry Pontius, who, who took over, who was the second head of, of uh, marketing for Walt Disney World, and they were trying to figure out what to do with it. And, you know, they, you know, just should we add a third course? And they actually they came up with a kind of intriguing idea for this third course. The notion was that what if the Imagineers, you know, forget about getting the professional golf designers. What if the Imagineers went around the world? And went to all of the great golf courses in the world and selected the best hole number one, hole number two. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. So, you know, for example, hole number one would be from Ireland. Ireland, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and the next one would be South Africa. And it would be this amazing in one place you could could have all these experiences. And in the end. It's like, it's like the Epcot of golf. There you go. There wow, you go. that's a great idea. Well, but it's and it's Is interesting. It so, no one's done that before. No one's done no, that. No one's done that, and it, it's interesting. Yeah, we're going into business. <laughs> okay, I'll get the sand. <laughs> uh, but what ends up happening is that uh, Epcot opens in October '82, and they actually see a significant drop in the number of people who are playing golf at the Magnolia and the Palm. Because now there's more stuff to do. Well, there you go. The second right. day is just going to be uh, now at the theme park. Oh, so that's funny. Though. So the theme park cannibalizes the golf stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, let me face it. You know, dad's traveled all this way, and now there's, and, you know, there's not that free day to sneak off and play golf. Right. All right. Uh, 1984 arrives. Card Walker and Ron Miller, who is also an avid golf player, are, are you know are pushed out the door along with Don Tatum. And here comes Michael Eisner, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and Frank Wells. And are any of them golfers? No. Nope. I mean, Wells plays tennis. In fact, you know that that's there's this great story about um, how Wells played tennis with Clint Eastwood, and that's how they basically got him to come to Florida. Uh, Eastwood lost to Wells, and Wells made him come to Florida sh to show off the studio. And uh, they had built the AA figure for you know the, the man with no name uh, in that the, the western scene of the great movie ride. Right. They didn't have the rights. <laughs> you know, it was Oopsie. like so. You know, it w was one of these things where they actually had to put a paper bag over the character's head. <laughs> You know, for the early drive throughs And so sure. Wells brings Eastwood. And Eastwood, why are you making me come to Florida? Why are you making me get on this ride? And, you know, five seconds before the door opens and they come into the Western room, and imagine it runs on stage, rips the paper bag off, and then you know, Wells, you know, Wells comes around the corner, points to the, the man with no name figure, goes, oh, that's cool. And said, you're okay with it? I'm okay with it. Here, I conveniently have a contract in my yeah. well just i just you know i, I have <laughs> this fell off the truck before i was uh, picking you up <laughs> there you go so but that's only because eastwood lost in tennis to to frank wells so <laughs> <laughs> well anyway i'm never gonna think of that scene any other way from now on in the great movie ride that's Are right you, by the way you said the great movie ride this is a tangent mm. great movie yeah. ride's getting uh, getting updated now what's up with that with uh Oh, okay. We got, I, we got I, two I, minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Um. I, I, all right. Not to let the air out of the balloon here. Um, Turn, this is Turner Classic Movies, right? It's a it's a pre show update. It's a post show update. It's it's also a rebranding of the banners outside. Uh, 
Robert uh, Osborne, who's the host of a lot of the stuff. He's going to live there now, right? That's his. Well, he's actually going to be the new narrator of the attraction, if, if what I've heard is correct. Oh, so they're um, not going to do. Uh, they're not going to do uh, cast members. Um. Well, or the, you know how? The, yeah, the voiceover beyond that. Okay. You, yeah, there's, there's na- narration in individual scenes, that sort of thing. Okay. Um. I, look, I, to be polite here, this is a patch on a bad tire. Um, originally the great movie ride was supposed to get a great big redo. Um, in fact, that's one of the reasons the giant hat is coming down in addition to visually intruding into the star Wars land area. Um, but given the cost of what it's going to talk, take to do all the Pixar stuff to the back of the park, plus the newly expanded beefed up star Wars stuff to the front of the park. Um, the great movie ride redo has been pushed back to we're five years out you know it'll be 2019 2020 with the idea that it debuts with a new ride system and significantly beefed up stuff uh for it'll be ready for the 50th anniversary in in 2021 oh so we got Uh, seven years yeah so but what you're seeing here is um you know just the theming is going to be adjusted. It's it's going to have that long overdue post show redo. Likewise, the stuff in the queue. I mean, it's 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 for movie purists like myself. It's 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 a wonderful association. More to the point, it also means that you know there's going to be a lot more Disney related content on Turner Classic Movies. Uh, there'll be a bigger presence in the the, the Turner Fest that's held in Hollywood every year. They've got that uh, cruise. Yeah, but it's not going to be, you know, don't expect big changes. I mean, there may be one or two scenes selected for redoing, but if people are looking for a, you know, floor to ceiling, top to bottom redo of this thing, yeah, that's not, not happening. No, I don't think so. Either. Okay. Anyway, so that's, uh, so that's good. So based, uh, so going back to Clint Eastwood in the seventies, golf. Yep. Okay. Golf. Okay. So, um, now we're in a situation where Disney's, you know, realizes that just having the name golf on the resort, if people are, no, I'm not, I don't play golf. Why would I want to stay there? So they, uh, starting in February of 86, they actually rebrand the resort. It's now called the Disney Inn. I mean, it's like, look, you take golf entirely out of it. Now it's Disney. And, you know, and to nail home that it's Disney, they retheme every room in the hotel to a Snow White theme. <laughs> uh, you know, and and you, with, you want Snow White, you want theming. Here's your theming. There you go. And and with the hope that this would turn it around, they add another 150 rooms. So you know, you wow, that's a doubling down right there. Yeah, still doesn't work. And worse than this, uh, when MGM opens in '89, uh, the Magnolia takes another hit. You know, the the the, the Palm. You know, again, fewer golfers. Are going yeah because now, now there's for those people who had the extra day after Epcot now there's one less day. So you know the weird thing is again Disney this is this is Eisner and Eisner is one of these guys who okay well let's just throw stuff against the wall and let's stick you know and and one of the things that you know that they were looking at guest service well why don't you stay in there why don't you do, why don't you play golf and it's like well you know they're kind of old fashioned courses and so okay old fashioned courses we can do something about that. Uh, they reach out to Tom Fazio and they reach out to Peter Dye and now we have two new golf courses. We have the Osprey Ridge and we have Eagle Pines, both of which would open in 92. Um, they then, when those courses open, they shut down the Magnolia and the Palm and significantly rework them. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, change out the grass, uh, change out some of the arrangements of the, the traps and all that, all with the hope of, you know, maybe this will turn it around. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, just eventually Disney has to throw in the towel. It's just, you know, that in spite of the Snow White theming and kind of changing the name, people still look at the Polly and still look at the um, the Contemporary and now the Grand Floridian, which are right on the monorail. And it's like, why should I pay to stay at this place that I have to hike a quarter of a mile right. to get to the monorail? Um, so <laughs> thirteen hundred feet. I know. Right. I, I know. I know. <laughs> Never mind how far they walk when they come to the Magic Kingdom to get to no, the. Camp. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. All right. So February eighty uh, or ninety four rolls around. All right. The Department of Defense is is looking to build a resort 
stateside. They have uh, d- or early 1990s. Uh, you know, they've got resorts all over the world for service members when they want to go on leave or take a break or, or you know that sort of thing. They have places to go, but they don't have one in the continental United States. So they really? do serve. No. Okay. Um, so they do survey work with the troops, and they find out the place that they'd love to have one of these things built is Orlando. And uh, Disney somehow gets wind of this. And <laughs> have I and got an elephant? I mean, a, a resort for you. <laughs> that's it exactly. It's so February '94, the Department of Defense leases the Disney Inn. Um, and it's just, and, and it's interesting. It's a hundred-year lease. Oh, really? They didn't buy it. It's a hundred-year lease. Well, it's, 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 don't, it's not get ahead of ourselves here. It was a hundred-year lease to begin with, but it allowed them to. Um, you know, ch- change the name to Shades of Green, which uh, references the the colors of the different u- service uniforms. Right. Um, so they now make it available to all active duty and retire military retirees. And DOD. Uh, and employees, yeah. it it suddenly this thing goes to the roof. Suddenly, oh, yeah. it's a hundred well, percent capacity. The, the, yeah, all the time. It's super. It's actually the only Disney resort I've never stayed in. Well, you know, and that's, that's we need to find some service members to help us out with that because I, you know, I remember going there during the golf days and and dining in the trophy room, and it was this amazing restaurant. I mean, a beautiful, beautiful hotel. Yeah. Uh, but but again, just empty. You know, just um. Anyway, it's probably it, not. It's probably not empty now, especially uh, especially at the rates. So the uh, the shades of green is interesting because it's got a tiered pricing structure. The lower your rank, the less you pay. To stay. Isn't that great? Isn't that it's great? fantastic? Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, it it does so well that in '96 the government turns around to Disney and goes, oh, "Oh, come on, you know we love this. You know, forget about the lease. We want to buy it." And Disney's like, "Well, sure. You know, we will sell you the resort for forty three million dollars, provided we can retain the the rights to the land the resort sits on." And <laughs> and again, you know, what what what. what that's an interesting concept of the word sell. <laughs> gonna, I, I have, we'll give this to you, but we're going to keep the thing it's on. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I it just some canny Disney lawyer came up with that. Um, and So they bought know, the building, but not the land that it's on. You know, and, and, and what's kind of interesting is this, if you know your Disney history, um, Disney bought, when Disney bought the land for a good chunk of Walt Disney World, the sale almost tanked because they found out the Tufts University in in Massachusetts didn't own the land but owned the mineral rights to the land. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just one of these things where, for Disney's way of thinking, it's like, mm, you know, we, we're going to need all of it. You know, so. Um, you know, on they, the one hand, I, th- I think it's it's creative of Disney to do the negotiations. On the other hand, if you're going to screw over any branch of the United States government, the military is probably the last one that you want to screw over because they're still the ones with the tanks. Yeah, <laughs> yes, so. would you would you like your would you like your land back? Yes, come get it. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you there. I no. mean, the Department of the Treasury. What are they going to do, right? But I mean, the military. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, all right. Yeah, now, looping back to the golf course just for a sec. Um, what's interesting about '96 is this: Disney suddenly back in the spotlight again because. Uh, you know, this is actually when 20 year old Tiger Wood, uh, is named Rookie of the Year because he wins the Walt Disney World Tournament. Really? Uh, yeah. He, this was the, his fifth tournament in a row where he came into the top five. And wow. so that was enough for, you know, for Tiger to, to, to come out, you know, and be recognized. So, um, meanwhile, Disney hasn't entirely given up on golf yet. I mean, you've got, you know, uh, again, earlier that year in May, you've got the Fantasia Golf opening next to the Dolphin and the Swan. That is a really difficult golf course. It, the the it, hard one. Mm-hmm. It's insane. It's insane. I, I told you I gave up playing that. I, I hit 100 strokes. I was like, <laughs> you... I'm done. Screw this. Wow. I'm out yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't anywhere near. It is an extreme. It's like everything is like a miniature Every mm-hmm. hole is like a miniature golf hole with, I mean, the, the greens undulate, there are water hazards, there's bunkers. It's, it's a hard, hard course. And that was deliberately done by the Avengers. They thought they'd do one fun one and one difficult one for, you know, for the golf, for the golf fans. And it, it turns out 
exactly what you're saying. There was just this, this complaint of it's too hard. I'm here to play miniature golf. I'm, I don't want to have a miniature stroke. Yeah, no, you know? I'm, I'm dead serious when I say I gave up at 100. I was like, I'm done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, meanwhile, you know, the, taking that lesson to heart when – Disney Winter Summerland opened at Blizzard Beach in March of 99. Mm -hmm. They made sure that, look, this has all got to be fun to play. We don't need kids throwing tantrums and throwing golf, you know, golf clubs around. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, so Winter Summerland is by far the easiest of the golf courses, uh, the miniature golf courses in, in Walt Disney World. It's way easier than even the easiest site of uh, Fantasia Miniature Gardens. But, you know, just, but at this point, really, it, it's kind of ironic given that, you know, uh, you know, if you if if you know your your Disney publicity, they used to talk about how if Epcot were a golf ball, how tall would a golfer need to be to hit it, and how far would it go? Sure. Um, by 2005, with the passing of Card Walker, Disney's enthusiasm for golfing really begins to fade. I mean, right. you know, this, this, you see uh, Eagle Pines close in 2007, and then then 2000. Eleven, a Disney actually farms out the management of its its. You yeah, know, this was software. interesting. This was to Arnold Palmer, Palmer. Yeah. Our, our our monorail driver. <laughs> uh, yeah, he took over. It's a twenty year strategic alliance, uh, and you know there are you know the Arnold Palmer Bur Arnold Palmer Golf Management operates, manages, maintains, and promotes all now four. Of the Disney golf courses, the Palm and Magnolia, the Lake Buena Vista Club, and what used to be Osprey Ridge. Osprey Ridge closed in uh, 2013 to, as we mentioned at the top of the show, to become Tranquilo. Uh, but the other thing that's worth noting about 2013 is this is when the PGA Tour just dropped its Disney you know, tournament. Yeah, um, they had it all the way up until 2012, right? Right. Uh, at, at that time, the name had changed multiple times. It had been the Oz, Ozmobile Tournament, and its last incarnation was the Children's Miracle Net, Network Hospital Classic. You know, there's a name you can really make, you know, you know a rapper. Yeah. Right? And, it, and, it takes up two pages on TV Guide just for the title. There you go. Uh, but, yeah, that, that that's, you know, it just turns out there a lot of the pros were just taking a pass on the show because there was more money to be had by appearing in, tournaments overseas right and so the interesting thing is that to bring things full circle here the one remaining uh pga show in the orlando area now is the arnold palmer invitational at bay hill you know where sandy quinn went all those years ago to bring arnold over to Funny. Well, um and, and and now we're there's always a question now that that you know is this just a temporary phase is that you know, could Disney, I mean, they've got so much land and, and, you know, and, you know, they, they did build another golf course or two over, down over by celebration. Does, mm -hmm. does this mean Disney's completely out of, um, the golf business or, you know, uh, and, you know, to be honest, Disney is, is, it's hard not to follow the trends. I mean, for example, in 2013, more golf co courses closed than opened for really? the eighth straight year. Um, wow. Yeah, I mean, let's see. Uh, in 2013, 14 18 hole golf courses opened. Uh, in comparison, 50, 157 courses closed. Wow. And you know, part of that is they're, they're being sold because the real estate that they're on is more valuable than the golf course. And they're, the, they're being turned into, into, um, you know, housing developments. And at the same time, it's kind of a generational thing. You know, yeah, it's not, just, not, it, not many people are age golf anymore. Yeah, so I don't know. It's just it, it it's just kind of strange when you think about it that that Disney bet so big into golf, uh, you know, and you know because of Card Walker and his yeah. love of the game, and you know now you've got Bob Iger who, uh, you know, to be honest, Bob's kind of a cipher. I, I he, you know, nobody knows what he has for hobbies. I mean, we don't really, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, you know that that's whatever I've read interviews with him. He's always so proud of what he can make his iPhone do. So, you know, <laughs> that could be it. Yeah, maybe that's it. We'll just build a giant iPhone that'll loom loom over the resort. We so. sent our uh, we sent our, one of our researchers over to uh, Tranquilo, uh, Tranquilo um, uh, last week or the week before. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the tour and everything, and uh, in four seasons, you know, give us the guided tour because we didn't. You can't you can't actually golf and tour at the same time. You have to do one or the other. 
okay. to sort of focus on it. But, um, uh, I mean, it looks, it looks amazing. There's a, <clears throat> going back to your thing about the, the wildlife, there are actually deer that roam, um, the fairways of the, uh, of the tranquilo, uh, course. What, did they, did he mention whether or not any of the osprey nest things were left in place? I, you know, I don't know, but the fact that I think that, that there are deer running around, I mean, and so the deer are actually, uh, fairly domesticated. They will come up to you and if you, mm -hmm. they'll give you, uh, like the, uh, um, the, you can carry like grains or cereal or whatever. The deer mm -hmm. will come up and eat it out of your hand. I've got pictures of my researcher feeding a deer on like the ninth hole. <laughs> you, you know, I, I, I I'm sorry, this is the Walt Disney Company. <laughs> what, you expected something different? Man is in the forest? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like, man is on the ninth hole. That needs Cheerios. Woohoo! And it's like, uh, yeah, uh, but it was, you know, it was bizarre. And, the, and it, it looks, it looks beautiful. I mean, the, the, the greens are, you know, really, really nice. The, uh, all the landscaping looks really, really good. Um, the, uh, the clubhouse looks exquisite. Um, so hold on, maybe let's, let's see the photos here, Jim, so you can see the photos. Okay. Um, being, not, not that anybody in the podcast is going to see it, but uh, anyway. No, just the, the irony is that that you know, and again, what's in a name? But you know, when they were building Osprey Ridge, um, <laughs> you know, they actually you know it opens in '92 with these six uh, giant Osprey nest platforms that are scattered around the course. And it wasn't until two years later that their first ospreys actually showed up. So it's, you know, yeah. you know, kind of, kind of a field of dreams. Build it and they will fly in. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right. right. So it'll be interesting to see if we, whether Disney can get a, uh, get another uh, PGA event. But, uh, in the meantime, it's a, uh, so what are, what are, uh, green fees for these things? What do they run? They're, they're fairly expensive, right? Oh, wow. Um, to be honest, folks, you want to go over to Disney Golf because it turns out that, um, if you say golf, you know, you start golfing at six in the morning, there's one price structure. If you're oh, going, that's right. I forgot about this. Yeah. It's, it's different based on how hot it is and the time of day. That's it. Exactly. So <laughs> would you like stroke or no stroke? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I forgot that. Yeah. You want to, you want to go either very early in the morning or very late at night, right? There you go. There you go. And, and, and bring your golf flow in the dark balls. So, um, and, and on that note, <laughs> and that note so. all right, well, this has been, uh, this has been a very interesting, uh, golf episode. We'll be back again on the 15th of the month, right, Jim? There we go. Yep. Awesome. We'll have lots of, uh, fun stuff to, uh, to talk about then. All right. You've been listening to the Disney Dish podcast with Jim Hill. Please go onto iTunes and rate our show and tell us what you would like to hear next. For Jim, this is Len. We will see you on the next show. Take care, guys.